This is the CTN Breakdown. You're listening to our breakdown of the New Bedford serial killer. Welcome, nerdlings! This is the first episode of the CTN Breakdown, which Ash definitely decided on the name for this one. So <laughs> basically, it allowed us to keep Nerd Bites selfishly. So. <laughs> so this is actually the show where we discuss last week's case, our thoughts, theories, any additional information that we want to share, things that came up in research, uh, stuff like that. So last week, we brought forth the case of the New Bedford Highway serial killer who struck New Bedford, Massachusetts during a five-month span in 1988. And this one's a doozy of a case and is still unsolved to this day. There were some suspects put forth in the case, but no one ever was formally charged with the murders of 11 women whose bodies were found lying along I-95 that year. So let's get into this case. Yeah. All right. Let's start tearing it apart. (laughs) So first and foremost, I wanted to kind of just like bring forth the clear connection between all of the victims. Mm. The fact that they were all from New Bedford in the red light district. Um, They all were going through some form of drug use. Mm -hmm. They all had brown hair. They stood around the same height. So... To me, it was pretty clear this uh, guy, this serial killer, um, had a type. Yeah. Because in a lot of cases, serial killers have a type. They have an MO. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that stood out to me. Did it stand out to you, Nat? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think just the way the women looked, their lifestyle. Um, the other thing, too, is the locations of where he was dropping the bodies. That These were all women who were left alongside the highway. Their bodies were left with no identification. So everything was intentional about, I think, the placements. They were placed in kind of like a sexualized position. Uh, So to me, it seemed like this, everything he was, every piece of this crime was mapped out and planned. This was all part of the process for this killer. Yeah, and um, something else that I noticed as well, you noticed as well too, that most of these victims all had a relation to each other. They were yeah. either friends in the same social circles. They had, um, or they were just an acquaintance to one another. Yeah. So that was also interesting. It was almost like, I don't know how big New Bedford is, but I'm sure there's different, I don't know if you'd call them cliques, but I'm sure there's different groups of sure people that hang out in different areas. So this killer must have kind of seen or mm. been in this area for the majority of the time that he was on, on the prowl. So yeah, I I wonder if typically I know when um when people are engaging in sex work they often are in groups of people you know just for protection and safety too you'll mm-hmm. often see that happening um so I wonder if that was part of it is like a safety thing that they were kind of all knew each other just from being on the streets together mm-hmm. yeah but um it is interesting that they all knew we had some kind of relationship to one another so I I thought that was that was really interesting. Do you think that 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 them having connections to one another? Do you think that that lends itself to maybe the perpetrator being somebody from within that social circle, or do you think it was somebody who didn't know them at all? Hmm. Um, it's tough because I have a couple theories on this um, killer, and one of the theories that I have is that it was a client mm. um, to some of these victims, but also, I mean, they're all. F- all acquaintances, all friends, but they all had the same – they all stood around the same height. They all had the brown hair. Yeah. So clearly this killer knew – I don't know. I feel like this killer knew them somehow, either mm. as a client or even, like you said, in the circle. Mm-hmm. Like maybe this person, this killer was one of the, um, the people that supplied drugs or sold drugs. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Well, and then there was also um, Ponty was one of the suspects that we mentioned towards the end of the episode, and he actually did know many of the women. So yeah, kind of puts him as somebody who maybe is more interesting for that – in that situation, I guess, if we're, if we're looking at it from that perspective. I could definitely see – him having had enough of a connection with, I think, the majority of the women, I, I could see why police had him on their radar. Oh, definitely. Um, whether I think he did it or not is is kind of a moot point, but um, that I, I do see why his name was, was thrown around. Yeah, I didn't think of that. <laughs> no, yeah, I just thought of it. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah that's, that's kind of interesting. That's a really good point. 
One thing that also kind of stood out to me was the night that Nancy went missing. It was raining. And her mm-hmm. neighbor actually tried to pull over and get Nancy in the car. Yeah. But Nancy, I don't I don't think Nancy responded. She didn't go in the car with the neighbor. She has kind so, of refused. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, who did Nancy get in the car with? Um, it was raining. And it was that night she disappeared. Yeah. And that's kind of where I circle back to a known client. Mm. Someone um, that she knew would pay. So that's why she got in the car. Yeah, exactly. Or you just know. like... I don't know. I don't know how close she was with her neighbor. Uh, maybe she felt more comfortable getting in a car with somebody she knew better. Mm. Um, I don't know. Well, I mean, and also just more than likely, she probably had Johns in the area that she she knew fairly well. So it could have been one of them. I mean, mm-hmm. it's and that's the assumed date that she disappeared. So. I mean, there's there's a lot of gray area in when these women actually disappeared because they weren't always listed as missing right away or, you know, it took the officers quite a while to identify the Jane Doe's as these women. So there's some gray area there, too. Another person that I also was thinking about who might have picked Nancy up was a police officer. Mm. Um, yeah. Because when I think of... I don't know, a, a drug-riddled area. Um, normally, there's police officers around a lot. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm sure you have the police officers that are around the red light district just to make sure everything, like there's nothing too crazy going on, maybe looking right. out, watching out for the sex workers. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that Or kind trying of came... to bust them, which in the 80s was more than likely what they were typically trying to do. Yeah, yeah. And... That was my thought. So maybe Nancy had um, a police officer pull up and say, hey, I'll give you a ride or whatever. I don't know. Well, or threatening to arrest her. And, of course, she's going to comply. She's going to get in a car if an officer is pulling up alongside and saying, hey, what are you doing? You know, you're you're doing a criminal act Mm -hmm. and then would then arrest her or put the put the idea of arresting her out there and then threaten basically threaten her enough to get in the car. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, when we first started going over this case, that was my first thought was that um, the New Bedford Mm. highway killer was a police officer. Yeah, that's a really Um, good point. I hadn't thought of that one at all. Yeah, just because, I mean, when you're driving on the highway, Mm. you're always seeing cops either pulled over in those turnarounds or on the side of the road and – you don't ever think you don't ever think anything of it. No, you're like oh, especially on the interstate. I see it all the time up here in Vermont. It's all the time. Every time I'm driving on it, there's always a cop on the side or on the shoulder. You just don't even like think twice. You just kind of get over and you're like, okay, yeah. So if it was a cop and they wanted to leave a body somewhere, they could easily do that. No one would think twice. Yeah. No one's really looking because they're not. You know, you don't want to really draw attention either. So it's kind of like the perfect. I mean, it's the perfect disguise in a terrible way. Oh, yeah. And I mean, there's shifts all throughout the day. So not only do you have shifts in right. the super early morning, you have shifts late at night. So you wouldn't ever think anything of a cop being out at 3 a.m. No. Um, and no one's going to report a cop as suspicious activity. Exactly. Yeah. Like if I saw a cop pulled over looking or seeming like he was looking in the in the woods or like walking through the woods, I'm not going to... I've seen it. You see them all the time in accidents, things like that. I would never call that in. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the Golden State Killer, he was a cop and he was under under the radar for several years before he was finally caught in 2018. Yeah, it was like, what, 40 years? Yeah, it was a long time. And he he had the little like dog spray or whatever that the cops had to deter dogs. He had like little things that he could use in his in his killings. Um yeah. Ugh. So yeah. Yeah. Things you'd never think of. No, absolutely. I I know it was really surprising that he actually had a an investigative background. That wasn't something that was thought at the time. I'd actually say the other one who's thought to possibly have a, a police um, background is the still uncaught or unsolved um, uh, Long Island. What is it? The Long Island serial killer. Yeah. That's another one that's always thought to maybe have a pot- possible um, police background. Yeah, because like you said, um, they can go under the radar. No one's ever going to think of mm-hmm. think twice about a cop nope. pulled over looking in the woods or oh yeah. yeah. 
It's actually a pretty, I mean, a lot of serial killers. There have been several who have had a, a, a police background, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Again, it's for that same reason. It's because you can easily, you know, like everyone trusts looking at the cop and being like, oh, they're going to help me versus, oh, that's a serial killer. You know, it doesn't yeah. like really register as like, you know, if you see a cop pulling you over, you're going to pull over and you're going to engage with that officer. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the way that they're able to get people. It's it's kind of a creepy thought. You ha- I hadn't really thought much about it, but ew, I don't like that. Plus the thought that I just had, um, if this killer was, um, was a cop, mm. you have radios. So oh. if you were on this certain highway – Right. And you had a radio and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm covering this this stretch. Like, we're all good. Oh. Um, you're letting the other cops know where you are, but you know, you also know when someone's coming. That's true. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if, if someone were to be like, oh, I have something over here, I got to go through. You're going to know if somebody, yeah, if another officer's entering the area or what have you. Yeah. I mean, that's a very valid point. I hadn't really thought of that. Yeah. So uh, one thing I would actually pause at, too, is where do you think the remains are for the other two missing women? Because unlike the other nine, their bodies were never have never been found. And do you think that they were left along the highway? Do you think they did something different? Um, do you think the bodies were just overlooked and kind of like lost to time? Um, I'd be curious what your thoughts on that are. Ooh, that's really tough because – it's so up in the air. Um, I mean, there's a small possibility that the two bodies that were never found weren't from the same killer. Mm. Because it seems like the New Bedford Highway killer has an MO and they stick with that MO. Oh, so you're saying that maybe like he abducted or that it was somebody, something else happened to these two. Possibly. It's, it's hard to say because mm. it's so across the board unless... Because it doesn't seem that this New Bedford Highway killer is burying any of the victims because no. the killer always put the victims mm-hmm. on the edge of the highway. Yeah. One thing I will know is that there was a there was a huge – there was several months where they could not search for bodies. So it was like um, – it was all during the winter months. So they had started in that like late fall finding people, had to take a break during the winter, and then were able to pick it back up in the spring. And that's when they found the remaining women. I would be curious if maybe in that time mm-hmm. something yeah. happened to the other two remains. It's possible. Yeah, yeah. And especially it's New England. There are animals. So I hate to say that, but, you know, I wonder if they have DNA evidence, actually, for, for any of these. Purely because I wonder if if they've done any looking into, like, other Jane Does that have been found years later or if there was any DNA evidence that they could reprocess mm-hmm. from the actual bodies yeah. from that time, things like that. Yeah, that's that's a tough question. How I'm going to turn this around on you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> to answer your own question, what do you think happened to the two bodies? Uh, I'm going to go with I think that they – I do think it's New Bedford. I do think he abducted those two women. Mm-hmm. They, they, they fit the criteria. They are small in stature. They were sex workers in the red light district. They had drug addiction issues. They had dark hair. So I, I think they did. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that either their remains just have never been found, which is possible. We see it all the time. Or he put them in a different location and they weren't ever associated, which is possible too. And so those there may be two Jane Doe's out there who have never been put with these cases. It's possible he drove to a different state or something. Mm-hmm. You know, it's right New Bedford's right in an area where it's easily to get to like four other states. So that's not unreasonable at all. It's New England. You and I both know you can drive this in no time at all. You can get across states. So mm-hmm. I, I, I would go with that. Um, possible that he did dump the bodies in that same stretch of highway in that area, but animals um, unfortunately maybe beat the investigators to it So or drug the remains off further into like the woods or something like that. Mm-hmm. So that would be my theory. But I do think it's New Bedford. I do think they're related. Yeah, yeah. Another thing is we don't actually know if if the New Bedford Highway Killer is male or female. True, true. There's not really a lot of evidence one way or the other. I I suspect he, but yeah, for sure. Yeah, because none of the victims that we know of so far um, were sexually assaulted, right? Um, Unknown, because a lot were skeletal remains. Mm, Right, okay, yep. 
and that their bodies were put in in sexual ways so that would yeah they were definitely posed so yeah. i would assume that there was a sexual connotation with this like um i know that the criminal uh Psychologists had kind of thought that this person had a marked behavior of violence against women, mm -hmm. um, suggesting more of the typical serial killer, you know, 30-something male. Yeah. Um, what I should say 30-something white males, typically, what that kind of boils down to. So I I kind of lean towards this as male, personally. Mm -hmm. I know that, that it's very possible for women to be serial killers. That is definitely – we've seen it before. Belle Gunness is a prime example. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to discount that, but – in this case, I do think it's a male. Yeah, yeah. I am on that same boat with But that's you. a valid point. Yeah, very valid point. Yeah. You know, I would be curious, though, kind of talking about the bodies a little more, though, if there was any evidence of, like, any other attack on the women. So, like, you know, I know that there was only so much released to the newspapers, of course, and this is an unsolved case. So we know in our experience, a lot of times, a lot of the information is withheld from the public. In the ideas of not wanting to taint any future, you know, suspects, things like that. You want to be able to actually charge them and not have your case thrown out. So I get it. But, um, you know, one of the things that it mentioned that the women were strangled, but it didn't really say if anything else had been done to the women. So I would be curious about that and if there was any other evidence of, an, of a further attack on the women outside of strangulation. And if they were strangulated, how – because they, that was one thing I couldn't find either was how the women were strangled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I suspect it probably wasn't ever released, but. Yeah. And that's another thing. Um, I think I've mentioned it before. In a lot of the cases that I've looked at, when people are strangled, mm. it's normally by somebody that knows them. Mm. Yeah. Um, just my theory. It's not anything else besides my theory. But, um, you know, because you're actually seeing the life leave that person's mm. eyes so it's much more personal is what you're saying it's way more personal oh yeah i would agree there are some serial killers who do that because they want to see that it's like a power trip they want to see that um what's a they want to exert that control over their victim yeah that's true because i was thinking israel keys i think strangled most of his victims except bill courier i believe he shot bill but everybody else he had strangled Mm -hmm. That's true. I didn't think of it like that. But I think you're right with the idea that it's it's a personal behavior. It is a very intimate – it's kind of sickening to say the word intimate in this situation. But the idea behind it is that the killer would look at this as an intimate situation between them and their victim. And mm -hmm. that it is they, – they romanticize it in its own way. So it kind of does still fit with what you were saying. Yeah. And it fits kind of in the lines with – um this killer being a client because mm. the oh. client would know would know them so they're having that little bit of intimacy with this person yeah yeah it's very possible i mean i would definitely agree that this person has a history of violence against women uh, uh, for sure i would definitely agree with that these are very these are very pointed attacks and it's interesting that they are targeting sex workers because typically unfortunately sex workers tend to be a very um easy target for a lot of murders, a lot of killers and, and um, abusers because of the nature of their work. And so they tend to end up being in situations that they come face to face with people like this a lot more than maybe maybe other people would. Yeah. And I did think about the possible connection with Gary Ridgway, mm. but oh, yeah, he, he didn't did seem too. to have any ties with the state of Massachusetts that I could find. Mm -mm. Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. And then I thought of a possible copycat killer, but then mm. I realized Ridgeway wasn't caught until 2001. So they wouldn't have so been that known. Wouldn't, yeah, that wouldn't have made sense. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it is interesting with Ridgeway. He does have a similar MO. So, and I think there's been a, I can't off the top of my head think of some other, but I feel like there's been some other serial killers who had similar ones to this too. Mm -hmm. I immediately think of the Connecticut River Valley. That's another unsolved case that happened, I think the last attack was on Jade Borowski in 1987. I think it was in the fall. And then uh, August, I want to say, we see a few month gap and then, you know, New Bedford shows up about six months later, you know, strikes for about five months and then disappears. Michael Nicolau has always been considered one of the leading suspects for Connecticut River Valley killer. I would be curious if, if it's ever been Posited of him being possibly involved in the New Bedford 
as there are some similar markings to this with women being left alongside the highway. Um, I know that the women in Connecticut River were stabbed, I think, as well as strangled. So I think it was both. That's why I'd be curious to see if there was more or if there was further attacks on the women's bodies um, than, than what was stated about just strangulation. But it's not – I mean, Jane Borowski survived. That was the last victim of the Connecticut River Valley killer. And – she survived. She lived. So she could actually put a face with the killer. After that, you know, Connecticut River Valley killing stop. And then again, we see this six months later in New Bedford. It's very possible that it is the same serial killer and they changed their MO because, I mean, let's be real, they were almost caught and they could be identified. So I don't know how much I, I believe that one, but I do want to throw that one out there. Yeah, that's a that's a really valid point, actually. And didn't Michael Nicolau have ties to Massachusetts? He and his wife lived in his first wife lived in uh, Massachusetts for a period of time. Actually, he's kind of got ties to all of this area. His wife was from Vermont, and her family still lived in Vermont, and they lived in that area along the Connecticut River Valley. So uh, it's just interesting to me because again, the Connecticut River Valley killer was going all along that river, uh, the highway system that runs along that river. And doing the same thing, leaving bodies off into the woods. And we see this with New Bedford, where they were doing the same thing along the I-95. So it was just intriguing to me that, I don't know, it's it's the kind of marker of those, um, what do you call it, the uh, the highway killers. Yeah, that's a really, really strong connection, I think. Yeah, I would be, I'd be curious if he was ever ruled in or out. I'm sure he was probably ruled out. I'm sure they've looked at him. But it was just something that always struck me is, is the similarity between the, the cases that yeah. I was like... It's only six months apart, and it's, you know, New England. It's You can cross the states in a day. You can get through all of them, so. Yeah, definitely. I don't know. It just seems weird that we would have two active serial killers in New England in six-month span. Uh, it seems a little strange. Yeah, but so close together. Yeah, it's a little weird, but, I mean, crazier things have happened, so. <laughs> but he's always one that I've, I've always thought was kind of interesting, that I was like, mm, could be him. So I'm going to ask, uh, Ash, do you think any of the listed suspects that the police had um, looked at were the actual killer? Um, Tavares, Ponte, and... Uh, DeGrazia. DeGrazia. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, they are... Oof, they're all pretty strong suspects. Um, yeah. The interesting part for me was DeGrazia. He was the one that would always go to choke the woman. Yeah. Yeah, and the other sex workers would warn the other women and other sex workers to stay away from him. Mm-hmm. So that kind of stuck out to me, which was seemed right. really, really scary. Me too. And he had, a, you know, a history of violence. Like he, he seemed like the most likely fit to me because it sounds like he knew the women of the red district fairly well. He was constantly, he seemed like he was getting involved with situations there frequently. So it, you know, tracks that maybe other women had been victims of his and maybe yeah, some just survived. Yeah, because yeah, we saw that woman go to court and basically say he tried right. to, to strangle her. Yeah, she very well could have been a possible or a future potential victim. So, yeah, he's one I, I go back to, too. Is I, I definitely think he's – I would go with him more than I would Ponty. And Tavares, while Tavar- Tavares has killed other people for sure – I, I don't like him for this crime. I don't know. It seems a little bit – he doesn't seem like he has a strict MO, and this has a very strict discipline to mm-hmm. these crimes. Yeah. But, yeah, I I, I, I definitely think DeGracia um, is a potential for yeah. sure. Yeah. He was the one that stuck out the most to me too. Yeah. Ponte, Ponte would be the other. I, I don't know about Ponte. Ponte, it's interesting that he did have some kind of relationship ties to a lot of the women. Yeah. So whether he just knew them from work or from where he was a lawyer or if he knew them from, you know, as coming to his home for the drug culture, what have you, it is interesting that this man had a connection to a lot of these women. Mm -hmm. And he's a lawyer. So if he did anything, he knew how to get out of it. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, kind of goes down with that. Yeah, he's, he's another one I go back and forth between. So at the end of the day, do you think it's one of them or do you think it's somebody completely <sighs> unknown? Um, I kind of feel like it's somebody completely unknown, to be honest. Yeah, I'm going to lean with the same. I think it's unknown. I I don't think they've ever come close. 
Uh, I think one of the reasons being, too, one of the unfortunate parts is that cases like um, New Bedford serial killer, they tend to kind of go, uh, what's the word for it? They don't get as much attention. They don't get as much um, publicity because, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of advocacy for sex workers out there. Mm -hmm. There just isn't. And so, you know, especially in the 1980s, things are hopefully going in a better direction. Um, I would like to think people are more considerate and more aware of the potential for victimization in that group but it's definitely still a lot of work to be done in that so I could definitely see that being some of the issues that maybe their cases aren't as heavily investigated as they should be Mm -hmm. or at least as publicized as maybe they should be yeah definitely so yeah I would lean the same I don't think the the suspect's ever been even close to being caught for this one well that's pretty terrifying to to think that they are still out there Yeah, they're still roaming those highways. Oof. Well, this concludes our thoughts on the New Bedford Highway serial killer. This is Ash and Nat signing off. If you nerdlings have any theories on this case that we haven't mentioned here or want to talk more in depth about the case, come join us over in the Facebook group and we can chat more there. We will catch you next time.